preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Hello, good evening, and welcome to our series, On the Edge, Conversations with Robert Krolwich. Before I introduce tonight's program, I just want to remind you about some upcoming events we have in the next couple of weeks. Tomorrow night, we have Mr. Brzezinski being interviewed by Charlie Rose. And then this Sunday night, we have a very interesting program over at Congregation Rodef Shalom uh, with Jane Goodall and Roger Fouts uh, discussing chimpanzees and wildlife and, and all sorts of interesting ideas as part of our science series. We also have a week from this Sunday on November 9th, David Mamet and Alan Dershowitz discussing the Leo Frank case and anti-Semitism in America. And then on November 6th, we have a special addition to our program, Donald Trump will appear. <laughs> and now for tonight, the format, as you know, is an interview followed by your questions and a book selling and signing right outside the hall. It's once again my privilege and pleasure to introduce our moderator for this series who will then introduce our guest. He has contributed so much to our programs with his keen intelligence, his wit, and his natural curiosity. He is truly unique among journalists and he really inspires me and countless others to ask even more questions. And as you know, he is the ABC news commentator and Nightline correspondent, and he is so committed to our programs that despite the drama of the stock market that he was involved in today, he still made sure he could be with us and find time for us. One of the nicest people I have met and a good friend of the 92nd Street Y, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Robert Krolwich. Well, this has been a kind of a long day for me, but um, well, in in high technology. Also, I'm sorry, I, I sat on my glasses. I'm just uh, <laughs> was getting, you know, it was just one thing after another. I, and this is like the second time I've had to do one of these things with broken glasses. I hear the crack. I don't know exactly. Uh, having just entered the age of uh, aided eyesight, I have not yet to master the idea. These things only cost 14 bucks at places everywhere and on sale for 12 in my case, but I now know why. Anyway, um, in, in high technology circles, which would be the world of, of computers and uh, software and most recently the internet, Esther Dyson is, <clears throat> well, first of all, she's a pioneer. Of, of, uh, if you were just to try to isolate a handful of people who are universally respected and admired and gossiped intensely about and occasionally feared and always listened to, she is, well, as a she, she's probably the, at the top of the list and has been for a long time. Uh, because of what she knows, she has a newsletter. Basically, for most of the time that I've read, I've never met her until like a few minutes ago, but I've read her in her newsletter. Uh, it's also because of who she knows. I mean, she works now for the president and she knows Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and all the great thinkers and all the, the, you know, the big investors and everything in America and also in Russia and in Poland and in the Czech Republic. It's kind of interesting in her new book just who she, who she thanks at the end. These are just among the names of the people that she likes to thank. I owe much to, she says, Anatoly and Nina and Olga and Bob and Ginger and Misha and Masha and Boris and Evgeny and Arkady and Maria and Andre and Sasha and this is a test. Bogdan, Grigors, Jan Christoph, Tomek, Olaf, Piotr. Am I doing okay? Marek, Mark, Andreas, Peter. Good Peter. Janos, Edward, Silvio, Ulf, Roman, and Al Gore. <laughs> so, she knows everybody. So here, come on in. We're dressed this way because I was on TV today and she wasn't. And well, we, she told me that she was going to dress like this, which is fine, because that's how I would like to dress, but what could I do? So, uh, well, let's see. First of all, the Russia thing is a little interesting. 
you're a Zurich-born gal from Princeton, right? Right. So, w w first of all, how did you get interested in Russia or Russian or anything? I mean, you don't have a connection that I could discern. Yeah, it, it wasn't, well, it was my parents, but not because they were born there. My father was a physicist, and he went over a bunch of times. And, and is one. It still is, yeah. yeah. You'll probably hear him here sometime soon. In case he's in the audience, you wouldn't want to bury him early. <laughs> and he was also English. Hmm. So in our family, we didn't have this American thing. We knew the Soviets were bad, but the Russians were good. So in high school, when I had already learned German at home and French in school, and I really didn't want to take home ec, I decided <laughs> <laughs> Russian sounded kind of interesting, so I learned Russian, and then I always and they taught Russian where you went to high school they, in Princeton. Yeah. Oh, Princeton High School had Russian. Princeton High School. During the Cold War, they taught Russian. In Princeton, they were always pretty subversive. <laughs> I see. How many people in your class? Well, in my first year class, it was probably twenty-five. In my fourth year class, there were three, <laughs> and our teacher was. She seemed very old at the time, but I think she was twenty-two, and she was about. <laughs> A chapter or two ahead of us in the textbook. And did it come easy to you or, uh, or hard? Well, to be honest, pretty easy. I'm, I'm pretty lazy, so it's probably politer to say that it came easy and I didn't work hard. My aunt was an interpreter at the UN in Geneva, so oh, so it actually is in the genes. Now, growing up in your household has been a subject of lively interest to many people. Your brother, who is now in the kayak business, uh, among other things. Yeah, he's and also an in the book business. You should have yeah. him here, too. Oh, Lord. All right. Is it true that he lived in a tree for two years? Uh, I think it was more than two years. He. <laughs> How does one live in a tree? Uh, 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 I mean, assuming well, one is a up higher mountain. That's the easy mount. part. It's getting up that's a challenge. <laughs> he built himself a little tree house. He was, oh. He's an interesting guy. He's. He's kind of an operator. He, he was a draft dodger. He was always doing something or other. Not professionally, and just as, you know, as like many people of that generation. Yeah. yeah. And he, but it, what he did that was very clever, he, somehow he got the city of Vancouver to decide that they needed a caretaker for this nice mansion up north of Vancouver, which had very nice grounds. He Vancouver's really, not in the United States. No, he was oh. a draft dodger. Oh, he was like, he left? Yes. Oh, okay. For real, this, okay. this guy's for real. So he found this great mansion, signed on as a caretaker. Somebody I didn't like Did the person in. in the mansion know that he was gonna be the caretaker? There was nobody there. <laughs> uh, I don't know why, but he preferred to live up in the tree. And so he was caretaking for a mansion with no one in it and living in a tree? Yes. <laughs> How, is, he, are you, is he your baby brother or your older brother? He's. 18 months younger. I see. Well, there's one nice other part of the story. People like you, normal people, they think this is kind of weird. So the Seattle Post Thank Intelligence. Thank you very much. I, I'm not called that often. This, in my family, you're normal. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the Seattle Post Intelligence sent a reporter and a photographer up to find out what this guy was doing in the tree. And Didn't he come down from time to time? Well, he stayed up there, and this, the photographer climbed all the way up to the top to take his picture. And he was so impressed, he eventually followed her down and married her. <laughs> he probably hadn't seen someone in so long. <laughs> well, she's actually pretty beautiful. Is she in the audience, too? No. Oh, OK. But you never know. Uh, now, that's the brother. Now, your father is not and he is a fairly well-known fellow, is Freeman Dyson, who is a very prominent physicist. Um, this, the most interesting tale I could find in him this morning when I was raffling with him is a, a fairly interesting, for a while during the Battle of Britain, he worked for the Royal Air Force. Right. And he had a beef. What was the problem? The problem, which is a very serious one and is why he's never been a big fan of authority. The airplanes had escape hatches that were too small for the boys to climb out when the, when the planes were shot down. And he did a lot of calculations and showed this to the authorities, and they paid no attention. So, so in a desperate life or death situation, had the, the opening been wider or whatever, yeah, they would have been able to Yeah, more of them could live. have escaped and parachuted out. 
Did you sort know? of the O-ring of his generation. The O-ring. <laughs> and this was a story that you knew? Is that where your general suspicion of large, big institutions might have come no, from, No, it was Dad? more organic. It was, I think, an overall attitude rather than a specific story. Certainly, we knew that story. It was a family, one of our family legends. Now, your mom was a mathematician. Uh, is a mathematician? Is. Well, is a mathematician. Yeah. And she left home and went off to Berkeley. You would visit her there. It, it, you know, what did you do when you visited her there? Well, my brother and I played elevator tag in <laughs> Campbell Hall. <laughs> At the University of California. Yeah, and we learned how to bowl. Uh, this is not a well-known fact, but in the student union at Berkeley, there's a bowling alley. <laughs> We learned how to bowl. What, what years were this? The six well, this was from sort of the summer I was eight to the summer I was 13 or 14. So this is early 60s or late 50s? Yeah. And Ted Kaczynski was around at some point, although... The Unabomber? You bowled yeah. with the Unabomber? Well, no, no, no. See, this is how the press gets things wrong. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just searching for the headlines in case there are any. Yeah. Um, we probably bumped into him in the elevator, but I don't recall it. I do not was recall. Was he a faculty a kid? Quote. Was that it? Or, or was no, he, he, was a, he was teaching there. He was a grad oh, student. He was a grad student. In math. But my mother claims not to remember him either. <laughs> <laughs> now, you leave for college at a tender age. Yeah. Was that because you had mastered Russian and you had nothing else to do with Princeton High? Or, did, or you, when did you go to college? Well, it was 15, 16? I left when I was 15 and got there when I was 16. You walked? <laughs> no. Where I, did you, you didn't go to college in town, right? You went to... No, I, the whole point of going to college was to get away from a wonderful but very European family. They didn't know what a teenager was. They knew about children, they knew about adults, but teenagers were not. Oh. And I knew about teenagers, I wanted to be one, but I didn't know how at home, so I left. Well now, then, so you arrive at, at Harvard at... 16. 16. And I passed as a teenager very successfully. <laughs> what does that mean? Oh, it means you, well, I got my braces taken off, I got contact lenses, I started wearing makeup, the usual stuff. And now, weren't, didn't you feel, I mean, 15, 16 to start college, but most people, assumably they were like 17. Girls are very mature. Oh, girls, that's right, I forgot. <laughs> So uh, now you spend your four years. Uh, it seems to me, from looking at, what, at that period, that it's you're a you become a reporter. Uh, that the Crimson was your hangout place. Yeah, I was too young to know better, so I tried out for the Crimson, the fall of my freshman year. It, it's supposed to be very difficult. I was probably the last person who got onto the Crimson by being a cute girl. <laughs> uh, after that, they got more politically correct, but I got on and had a great time. Stayed up till 2 a.m. every morning and. For the whole four years, then you pretty were much. I never went to class, but I, I loved the Harvard Crimson. And what did you major in? Well, the, first I started out in history. Then I changed because that's what my boyfriend was doing. I. Oh, you got a boyfriend? Like boom, huh? Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. you know that's what being a teenager. Teenager, means. of course. Right. Then then I went and lived with him in Morocco, for two months when I was seventeen. He was in the Peace Corps. Was this okay with the uh, Well, my parents were really good parents. They said, if you get into jail, we won't come take you out. <laughs> if you get pregnant, we won't get you an abortion. If you run out of money, we won't send you any. But go and have a great time. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. A and the guy uh, was a nice guy. He was a very nice guy. So then... Uh, you, uh, skipping quickly over the romance period, we go, uh, <laughs> when you finish college, what are you fit to do in your own, I mean, everybody, of course, has that problem, but what did you think you wanted to do? Well, I wanted a writing job, and I'm probably the only person who got a job through the Office of Graduate and Career Planning at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> and it was indeed writing, but it was writing promotion material for Viacom, which had just split off from CBS. They had CBS staplers. And I thought this was a big secret because nobody talked about it. Of course, everybody on Wall Street knew that Viacom had split off from CBS. And so and every day- And your clue day, was the staplers? <laughs> 
Well, you see, this the is what, stapler. This is something about openness and transparency. This is how employees feel in companies, because no one ever tells them anything. So they think all these things must be secret. So I was writing every day, uh, women, women 18 to, and eight, women 18 to, more, let's see, 19% more women 18 to 49 watch I Love Lucy stripped 5.30 to 6 p.m. on WGN-TV in Chicago than watch the closest competing show. And then there was a lot of boilerplate about that's I scams. Love Lucy. That's good, that's yeah. good. And then the next day was Hogan's Heroes. And I spent all my time going through Nielsen ratings, which at that point were in books. They weren't electronic. This is really long ago. Finding places where Viacom shows had done better than the competition. And was this for bus ads, or what were you, who were you writing for? No, this was sales promotion that people would, Viacom would send to TV stations to get them to carry I Love Lucy. Oh. So one day my boss said to me, Esther, why don't you just go home one night and watch Hogan's Heroes? <laughs> Uh-oh. I never, ever watched Hogan's Heroes. The entire time? Or well, since. I mean, that was a very sensible approach to doing the yeah. promotion for that. Well, they really didn't want you to say anything other than the ratings anyway, so it didn't matter. But around the shop, I think they probably talked about Hogan's Heroes and they knew who the movie stars in it were. So this was, sounds like a Manhattan job. You were in New York City? 666 Fifth Avenue. Uh-huh. So then from Viacom, where do you go? How long do you want to I don't know. I just, I'm just uh, I'll, I'll speed it up when I get bored myself. Great. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, let's see. Then I worked for the Bureau of Business Practice writing little stuffers for paychecks. Uh, there was... What do you write into a paycheck stuffer? Oh, it Another was... Another great week, Maria? Or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, these were, these were things that people would buy from the Bureau of Business Practice to put into their employees' paychecks to oh, motivate oh, them. So there was OG for office girls and MS for medical secretary and PS for personal secretary. And we would basically steal it from Mademoiselle. There would be things like, one of the girls in the office uh, doesn't pull her weight and she always makes other people do her mimeographing. Can you help? <laughs> so we would- This is fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I really, didn't know there was such an industry. Uh, uh, go ahead, go ahead. You, you learn a lot about I have a great deal of respect for office workers based on those experiences. It was, it was dreadful. I had a headache every day until 5.30. <laughs> well, I'll just push ahead then. Uh, <laughs> we go, uh, somewhere along the line you go to work for Forbes, and then yeah. somewhere after that you go to work for a guy named Ben Rosen. Who's Ben Rosen? And, well, in between oh. I worked on Wall Street for five That's years. That's right. Uh, and as an and that was where I got imprinted with what a cute little company should look like. I started with Cray Research and Federal Express and Tandem and Apple Computer. Oh, you were an analyst. So yeah. You, you visited with these people. Yeah, I visited with them and I was telling people which stocks to buy. And I really liked the companies. I hated the customers. <laughs> Once we were sitting with some clients in Chicago and I was the analyst. There was the sales guy and we were telling this guy what to do with his portfolio. But I kept saying, I can't tell you which stocks to buy. I only analyze the companies. And the salesman said, well, I'm new with Oppenheimer. I can't really tell you which stocks I personally recommend, just what the Oppenheimer recommended portfolio with. And the client kept saying, well, I need more advice. You know, what? And finally, I said, well, I think you should churn your account. <laughs> <laughs> he was, I'm sure, very appreciative of that. And this was shortly before I joined this guy called Ben Rosen. Ben Rosen had also been on Wall Street. He was the guy who brought Apple to Morgan Stanley and brought in that initial public offering business to Morgan Stanley. He felt he was not properly recognized for this and probably a bunch of other things. So he started his own company called Rosen Research. And what had been the Morgan Stanley electronic letter became the Rosen electronic letter. Now, this man is sort of a legend, right? Yeah, well, he also started investing on the side. And he gave money to this guy who had just finished being a transcendental meditation teacher called Mitch Kapoor. And he gave money to this really 
sort of nerdy engineer in, from Texas Instruments called Rod Canyon. For those of you who aren't following this, this would be like seeing a kind of a nice girl with blonde hair who happens to be Marilyn Monroe and you're a casting director. Yeah, this right. This is big. Yeah. So he kept on writing this newsletter and then there was a problem, which is he couldn't write about the computer industry without mentioning these two companies that these two guys had founded, Lotus and Compaq. With his money. With his money. So he thought, well, great, I'll hire someone and they'll write the newsletter and that will solve my conflict of interest. So he hired me. How'd you meet and, him? Well, we were hanging around on the circuit on Wall Street in the computer oh. business. And I went to his conference a couple of times called the Rosen Forum. And that was where I met Steve Jobs. I met Steve Jobs at the Playboy Club in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. <laughs> can you remember the scene? I, I can indeed. Regis McKenna said, hey, Esther, you should really meet Steve Jobs. Because, of course, he was trying to promote Steve and Apple. And this conference, it was one of Ben's bigger mistakes, was held at the Playboy Resort in Lake Wisconsin, <laughs> Geneva. So here I am. And a Playboy bunny is serving me and Steve Jobs <laughs> and Regis Diet Cokes, and that's the story. Um, so anyway, I bought the biz I started writing the newsletter. Everybody said, oh, Ben's got this girl, but she just writes what he tells her to. And they didn't believe that I had a certain mind of my own. So I bought the business. How much did it cost you? It cost... I don't think I've ever said this in public before, but it's not a secret. Nobody's ever asked. They're so polite. Uh, I don't want to know. Yeah. I'm sure it was a tidy sum, I'm yeah. sure. Well, he basically sold it to me for a very small amount, but he left a lot of debt behind. He took all the cash out. Oh, I see. So I ended up with what was a leveraged buyout. So you and probably paid a buck, but you then owed somebody $10,000. Exactly. No, 400 k Really? Really. But we paid it back. Yeah. All right. Um. <clears throat> anyway, that became Adventure Holdings, which is my company, and now we're in 1997. <laughs> well, no, not quite. I'm going to... I'm going to... Um, the, the thing about Ben Rosen, I guess, is that, is at least from a distance anyway, he looks like the kind of person who was good at picking people, quite clearly, good at recognizing a good idea, yeah. quite clearly, and then good at sort of reporting it out. You seem to be good at all those same kind of things. I try to be. Which raises the question of Russia in the spring of 1989. What, first of all, what is it about, I mean, it's not exactly a startup country at this point, but it's close. It's actually leveraged by a... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, where, when you first went to Russia, where were you, why did you go, and what was your first impression? Well, the year before, 1988, I had been intending to go to, to, go to China, but I, I didn't get my visa, I didn't make it, and I ended up spending four days in Barbados, which was my first vacation in 10 years or something. Barbados, which yeah. is, of course, right on the way to the China. The other way. Well, no, so 1989, a year later, I thought, well, this time it's really going to happen. And I was invited as part of a computer delegation by something called the International Computer Club, which of course was not a club. It was sort of a Russian trade union of banks and railroads and things that used computers. It was a Soviet organization. And it was me, Sherry Turkle, who may be known to this audience, who wrote a book on children and computers and most and recently, MIT. Life on the Screen, a psychologist, and Gary Chapman, who is head of computer professionals for social responsibility, which is sort of exactly what it sounds like. Um, <laughs> so it was the three of us, a motley crew. We showed up April 19th, and about three days later, a delegation of genuine German businessmen showed up. And so they, they abandoned us. And we How do you know they were genuine German businessmen? Well, they had real money, you know. Oh, oh, we I were see. <laughs> attached to their lapels. Yeah, we were kind of useless. So I had gotten a few names of some computer programmers to call when I got to Moscow. Wait a second now, I'm waiting for the Excelsior moment. When you landed in Moscow, you had learned Russian, I assume you thought about Russia. When yes. you land there in the springtime, what's it? What? Well, I flew in overnight, I don't remember. I, okay. I probably woke up and 
wanted to go back to sleep, got met by these guys, and they took us to the flea bitten hotel that you've also stayed at called the Russia. Right. And I don't really remember that part. What I do remember okay. is one of the numbers I got was for Alexei Pajitnov, who wrote Tetris. Famous guy, even then. So Tetris is a computer game where things yeah, just they, keep falling. Yeah, heard of Tetris. Well, I don't know. Have some you have, heard of some haven't. See? Have you guys heard of Tetris? No. Like, row one. <laughs> so anyway, here I am, world famous Alexei Pajitnov. I have this number. I call him up. My Russian is not great. I, I don't remember whether we spoke Russian or English. But anyway, I was kind of scared of this world famous computer scientist. And of course, Pajitnov, whom I got to know quite well, and for what it's worth, footnote, now works at Microsoft. <laughs> uh, Pajitnov is sitting at home in his kitchen with his computer and his kids around and whatever, and this American lady calls. And so he was scared to bits. He didn't know who I was. I must be terribly important. I'd come all the way from the United States. And anyway, we met. We realized, both of us, that we weren't very scary. And through him, I met a whole bunch of other people. Sherry, Turkle, and I together found the guy who was the first man to publish Freud since the 1920s in Russia. And we just had a ball. I stayed there for three weeks. When I arrived, it was snowing. When I left, it was May Day. There were marching parades. It was sunny. I was wearing a T-shirt. And do you then decide that you like to come back? No, I thought this was it. I came back. I wrote something for my newsletter called Three Weeks That Shook My World. And it, it did. It, was, it taught me a lot more about the US than about Russia. But I thought, this is it. The stuff I said about Russia wasn't very complimentary. They wouldn't want me back. And it was. It was a vacation, I, so I had to get back to my day job. Then they made that into a cover story of Forbes, because I still had some relationship there, even though they fired me. It was a friendly <laughs> firing. And in September, somebody invited me back. It was, in fact, the guy who ended up running Microsoft's Now, September in there. Moscow is a different thing than May in Moscow. Yeah, it, it was. By the time I got there, it was October, and it was snowing again. But that second time was also interesting. It was, in fact, the time that while we were there, there was this earthquake in California disappeared, according to the Russian press. Disappeared? If, if you recall, it didn't quite disappear. But it was a relief to find out it was still there when I got back to the US. <laughs> and then in December, I got invited a third time. And this third time was, was the kicker. The first day, I was invited to go visit Zelenograd, which had been this closed Soviet city where they do military production. And it sounded very interesting, but it was just incredibly boring. There were a bunch of Soviet officials who gave speeches that I could sort of understand. And then there was a translator who translated them into English, and they were not much more intelligible. <laughs> But meanwhile, I had invited this guy I met who was working as an exchange student looking at military production. I thought maybe he would be more interested. And he had a great time. The second day, I just called in sick and went to see all the programmer friends I'd met before and had a wonderful rest of the week. And I had decided somehow, I have this habit of knowing what to do without knowing in advance. Somehow I decided to go through Budapest on the way back. I thought, well, this is your third time to Russia, and it's clear there's, it's not a real, you can't, you can't do this as a business, but maybe Central Europe, there's something there. So I went home through Budapest, and this was the weekend that next door to Hungary is Romania. This was when they had the Romanian Revolution, they executed the Ceausescus. It was quite an intense time. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting in Hungary feeling homesick for Russia. It was bizarre. And huh. that was when I knew I'd go back again and again and again. Now, you've described this from time to time as falling in love with an addict or a self-destructive love affair. Yeah. 
what's wrong with Russia? I mean, obviously you liked it, but another time you said if you were a maid, you like a, prefer a messy room to a tidy room. And Russia's the ultimate messy room. Oh, so what, you wanted to sort of clean it up? Yeah. Um, I like, if you're, if you're lazy, you like to be able to do small things with big impact. And if you do almost anything in Russia, it's a miracle. Uh, I've helped lots of little companies get started. The, the stuff that Sadima does in here, how to do marketing, uh, knowing Bill Gates, everybody I know knows Bill Gates. In Russia, it's really special, and so... <laughs> it is in certain quarters in America to yeah. clue you in. <laughs> um, well, because it, it was interesting to me, just in, in, in the book, which we'll get to, I, I'm sure you're waiting for that, but we'll get to it immediately soon. Uh, what they don't know in Russia was astonishing to me. Yeah. I mean, you have, uh, you have to tell somebody that a customer is not someone who's there to annoy you. <laughs> that you have to be different from your competitors. These are novel thoughts to, yeah. to business people, or yes. to want to be business people. If you've grown up being told profits are dirty, uh, if you've, to, to a, a Russian, service is servitude. You're, you're supposed to be, the only thing you serve is the state. It's just, the whole mindset is totally different. And so, yeah, these were novel concepts. My favorite one, which is in the book, is this is great. Our government's going to set free market prices just like yours. <laughs> so what do you do? I mean, I don't understand how you handle this. If somebody doesn't quite understand the A's, the B's, or the C's, then how do you teach them to spell? And this must be very well, frustrating. That's, the, the people I dealt with were really smart. There are lots of... Soviets who are just never going to get it. But the ones, and this, this is actually very serious. Everything you've heard about Russia is true. All, all the contradictory things. Uh, it's horrible, it's wonderful, it's full of crooks, it's got great people. The computer business is different because most industries in Russia were privatized or stolen. Somebody took some assets from the state. How they got them, you probably shouldn't ask. In the computer business, all people had was their minds, and they built these companies from nothing. They didn't need to take anything from the state. And so these people are honest. They're smart. They tend to read and write English because they're, uh, many of them are programmers. They have a kind of international bent anyway. They're now on the internet. They have access to information from all over the world. So it's but don't people, don't gangsters and uh, folks come after them to steal whatever they've got? N no, they don't really get it. Actually, I'll tell you one more story. This was just a few weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was sitting much like this with a third person. We were, it's a friend of mine. He's trying to raise money. He's a Russian computer guy, and he's, he's wonderful. He's honest as the day is long, et cetera. And we're sitting with an American banker. And the banker is getting my friend's life story. And the banker says, so do you know these guys? I won't say their name, something systems. And my friend Sasha says, yeah, yeah, I know them. They, they wanted 25% of my company a while ago. And the American banker says, oh, how much? And Sasha says, no, they just wanted to be my partner. And the American says, oh, oh, I understand, yeah. So what happened? And Sasha says, I said no, because they couldn't take him over. He would have left. I mean, he had, it was in his brain. They couldn't steal it from him. And he was good enough that he just said no. I, the story was probably a little more complicated was than that. Was there a gun they, involved? I might understand something to that know. effect. Yeah. Um, they left. And then the American said, well, you know, we like the companies we invest in to have good relations with the authorities. And Sasha and I looked at each other and said, not this guy's money. I mean, this is a problem. Westerners come in there and they say, yeah, it's corrupt. We'll pay bribes. And they don't help. Huh. There is one friend you, well, before I get to Anatoly Karachensky, who is one of my favorites yeah. of, just looking in, 
Uh, Bob and Ginger, yes. two of your friends, uh, are going to be your, um, your hosts on one occasion. I forget which occasion you're going to Russia, and they've left their apartment for you. <clears throat> I was very fascinated, because I've, I've always known that there's a certain amount of lawlessness and you don't know what to do. And what it, They have an apartment in some apartment building, and they give you the key to go to their house. You then go into the house and try to open up the door. Oh, that story, yeah. yes. What happened then? Um, there had been some kind of dispute, <laughs> and somebody had changed the lock. Yeah, I'm trying, I still... Now, the, the, now then the landlady had somehow moved back into Bob and Ginger's apartment and invited you yeah. to spend the night with the landlady? You have the key? I, I, I kept it as a souvenir, believe it or not. <laughs> oh I, sort of, I haven't looked at this in years. But um, that means that you can have an apartment in Moscow and you go away for a month or whatever and you, you leave the apartment for a guest and there's, the door is locked, someone else is living in the apartment and there is no recourse. I assume you can't well, call there, the there sheriff. Well, there was a recourse I got in, but But you had to live with the landlady, right? Well, sometimes this happens in the U.S. too. True. Avenue B, a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go to Anatoly uh, Karachinsky. This, this, is a, this comes to me from, I was looking at the London Financial Times. Mm -hmm. This, I think, is maybe the dream that you had. As occasionally, it must come true. Yeah. This guy, at least according to the London Financial Times, has designed bank telling teller machines, automatic teller machines, that are so fancy and so facile and so interesting uh, that the London Financial Times said that this particular machine that they looked at had leapfrog Western ATMs. But it seemed to be sort of cobbled together by this man. First of all, who is Anatoly Karachinsky and how did he do that? Well, he, he is a miracle. In fact, he's, the, the computer market in Russia is now so open and transparent that they have top 100 lists and he's regularly number one. When I first met him in 1990, he was running, he was running this joint venture between an Austrian dressmaker and two Soviet science committees. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, but he, and I've seen him through a bunch of changes. He now has a company called IBS, this was yeah. not a very nice Austrian dressmaker, as I recall. He was, yeah. I wrote about this in the New York Times Magazine, in fact. He was a jerk. In the end, he wanted to sell the computer business so that he could start making dresses in this piece of real estate. Uh, meanwhile, the Soviet partners, the science committees had disappeared. So in the end, Anatoly left this and started amazing, over. This amazing, really. So this guy uh, has three backers. Two of them disappear, and one of them wants to take over the office and make dresses yeah. in it. Yeah. Is this normal? Absolutely. <laughs> and the amazing thing is, the guy left and built a whole new company. He's gotten an investment from Citibank in one part of his company, which sells Dell computers. He's doing large projects for banks. Uh, he's got a distribution company called D-Line. And what did and he have that other entrepreneurs there don't have? Well, he had a combination of paranoia and grandiosity and persistence and vision. You write and about him that he's, yeah. he has something, he's always sort of on a scale between paranoia and ambition. Well, no, he's now gotten integrated. He started out being <laughs> paranoid and grandiose and now he's integrated into a successful, confident business guy. Why is paranoia an advantage, uh, assuming that it is? Well, it was. Why? Um, because you had, it's only the paranoid survive. That's what Andy Grove says. I cite a higher authority. <laughs> All right. That was a book title, I think. Andy Grove believed in it so well. Um, let me get to the bottom line here, the least I wrote. In The Economist, you quoted, so this is interesting to me. You, you wrote, I don't know if you still believe this, that Russia and Eastern Europe are now, these are your words, more receptive to change and therefore to information technology than our Western Europe or even the United States? I might not put in even the United States, but definitely the Western Europe. So as nutty as it is in Russia, they 
could be a platform for whole new technologies or whole new adventures yeah. that, that you wouldn't find in Paris or London or Cologne or Absolutely. Frankfurt? Absolutely. Why? Because in Russia, they see the value of this. It connects. Russians want, quote, a normal life. They want to be part of the world. They've been cut off. They feel, they feel paranoid and grandiose. They feel mistreated, and they feel they deserve better. And through the internet, they can connect to the rest of the world. They can reach worldwide markets. They can find out what's going on. To them, that's amazing and exciting. To a Frenchman, it's offensive. These people, they don't speak French. <laughs> All right, put the French aside, but uh, <laughs> London, for example. Well, you know, we've got what works already, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but don't the Russians have a fairly a famous attitude because everybody else has probably got something wrong with them? We are Russians and we can always go out and look at the birch trees and sing with the nightingales and no well, one else can do it. it Certainly, I'm not talking about all Russians, but in the computer industry, which is a growing part of the economy, and the computer, the computer world is a growing part of the world economy, too, these guys are much more eager to jump onto it. They, they see its value. It's, if you have nothing, the relative value is much higher. You know, the United States likes new stuff because they like new stuff. Western Europe doesn't like new stuff. Uh, the Russians look at it for its intrinsic value to them and say, this is pretty neat. Well, let's go to the book. Uh, first of all, what is this title? I mean, for people who aren't familiar with packaging of technology products, release 2.0. Show them the picture. Thank this, you. Is the, this is the book. This is the picture of this Dorian is Gray. Her in yellow and orange. And this is the title. What does that mean? Okay. How many of you know what release 1.0 means? Okay. Well. Yeah, well, I saw some of them if, do and some of them don't. In the software business, when you come out with a new product, you, it's just like writing an article. You have a draft. You, you go through a bunch of versions. It gets better and better. And you think you're almost done. And you call it release 0.9 almost release 1.0, then you get release 9.3, sorry, release 0.93, release 9.4, then you get to release 0.982, <laughs> and then somebody says, ship it, I don't care. <laughs> and, and that's called 1.0? That's called 1.0. So if this were like, if you were trying tryouts on Broadway, like, you know, New Haven would be 0.5. Yeah. And then as you move closer, right. Boston would be 0.7, and then... Then opening night. And of course you hope it's perfect. It's, it's the realization of your fondest dreams. It's, it's all this wonderful stuff. And of course it's fresh and new. And that's what I call my newsletter. Every month, a whole new, fresh... Uh, hope to be perfect newsletter. It and your also newsletter is called what? Release, release 1.0. 1. Oh. Which also is the first three letters of Rosen Electronics letter. Right. And, but then of course what actually happens is a month later you say, oh my gosh, when you press print it uh, deletes the file or something <laughs> not so cool. So you come out with release 1.1 and if you survive that disaster, a year or two later you say, we're going to do a total rewrite. We're add new concepts, totally new product. We've learned a lot. And you go through the same thing, release 1.93, release 1.932, release 2.0. And the second edition. Yeah. Uh, new and of course, improved. There's going to be a you see, I love this. There's going to be a paperback called Release 2.1. Uh, oh, you're going to go. You're going to go with this metaphor till it dies on you. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's actually a very rich notion. You can also say, if if I were a salty old man, I'd say, life is always release 1.0. You can never really do it again. Uh -huh. And uh, this man is on release 5.0. He's really smart. He's changed his mind a lot. Oh, I see. Okay. So. Let me first of all describe my reaction to some of the things. It, the, the book is a description of the, of the internet and the community of the internet and, the, and your, your description of what it might be like if it were really working well. Um, 
But some of the visions you have are, at least to me, a little troubling. For example, in the world that you imagine, that is, all of this conversation, all of this literature, and everything that's coming through, there will be less time to think. Things will be much speedier. There will be more and more and more and more choices that you have to wade through and sort of work out. Uh, doing things uh, fast will be important, but so will performance actually even maybe more important than a completely carefully worked out thoughts. And that people will market themselves and they need to be a star. Does this, when you pull it all together, does this seem lovely to you? Or does it just seem to be the way it's likely to turn out? It seems, it doesn't seem lovely. Um, it seems like something you should know about and then you should have the good judgment as an adult to say so much and no more. I don't have a telephone at home. You don't? No. Thank you. Um, oh, there's an enthusiast for that position. Yeah. So. You know, you have to be a grown-up. There, there are going to be more choices. You have to have the, you have to make up your own mind. But you, there's also a lot more freedom. And you have to be better educated, better informed. You have, you have the right to control your own life, but you need to take control of it. Well, let me give you a couple of, let me delve into this sure. and give you a couple of problems. For example, I read in the Columbia Spectator a couple of years ago, just the, I live near Columbia, and there was a college paper. This is the story that I read. A group of sophomores at Columbia were sitting around trying to think of something to do, and they got it in their heads that they would go do, in effect, a sort of electronic panty raid. They were on a, a site on the web in which they were allowed to be sophomoric. Mm -hmm. There's nothing really quite as horrible, really, as being sophomoric with other sophomores, because everybody's sophomoric and nobody's insulted. Everybody just told bad, stupid jokes, and everybody then wrote, he, 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 uh, you know, and it very boring. So they decided that they would go do, to a very polite part of the, of the internet, and they found a group of ladies in the Midlands in England who were poodle fanciers. <laughs> And whose site it's was often work already. <laughs> whose site was, you know, they would write things like, very interesting rules when you have a poodle, to make sure that you do this. So it's very polite. It was sort of a white gloves place. So they went off to this site and began querying. it. Yes. Yeah. And they would say, you know, what would you do if I chopped your poodle's, you know, ears off and got in blood dripped in and it was very impolite. And the ladies were shocked and very disappointed. I didn't know who these phantom questioners were. It was very antisocial behavior in the truly sophomoric mm -hmm. sense. Oddly enough, what happens then is they went and hired some private detective or something to try to figure out where these interlopers were coming from, discovered they were coming from New York City, from Columbia University. They wrote a letter to the president of Columbia University. <laughs> who then reprimanded the sophomores for being sophomoric in front of the ladies in the Midlands. This occurred to me as such, so completely bizarre. <laughs> that, you know, the idea that there was a detective that the ladies would even think about New York, that the sophomores would find the ladies, everything about it. But it does raise a question, what, would you, what is the proper solution to the problem? Because uh, you talk a little bit about, uh, uh, of who governs this. If yeah. people want to act out, if they did it 10 times so it was truly obnoxious instead of funny, what could the ladies or anybody do about it, really? Well, I was trying hard not to laugh, but... You didn't succeed. <laughs> the, we're working on this, is the short answer. There, there are lots of things that would happen. First of all, you can have a closed community. I mean, the first time this happens, it's alarming and hilarious, and you get rid of the kids, and, and you hope they go bother somebody else. If they persist, you can do all kinds of things. You can require passwords to be part of your community. You can, I mean, that's the simplest one. If, if they do something really, really bad, you can try and trace them. And yeah, either call their college president or, you know, go to whatever community they are. I think you're going to find a lot of, in the long run, if I want to be on the net, I need to have an internet service provider who gives me my internet access. and. The internet service providers don't really like this idea because they don't want to be responsible, but I think in the don't end... Like what idea? The idea of Of what? being responsible for the behavior of the customers. They'd rather just shrug their shoulders and say, I'm sorry. But there's going to be a lot of peer pressure in the internet, and ultimately, if somebody is doing something bad, you're probably going to go to their ISP and say, cut this guy off. And 
You mean they, they would, they would, the people in England would go to whoever the kids at Columbia, I guess to Columbia University, and say, "We're going to what? We we want, we're going to tell on you to all the other servers so that people at Columbia can't talk to anybody anymore." That's sort of in extremis. Of course, it rarely escalates to this point. The Columbia University, I mean, as you saw, they don't want to be responsible for these jerks, and they'll tell them to stop it or they'll kick them out of college. Another ISP would say, stop it or we'll close down your account, and we will give your name to the other ISPs. Would a, a form of shunning, do you think, work? Yeah, and when it does, I mean, Again, there are levels of behavior, there are levels of shunning, there are different levels of sensitivity to bad behavior. An ISP that doesn't control its customers in the long run will find other ISPs blocking. You're seeing this happen right now with the question of spam. There spam, people, we should explain what that is. Uh, spam, that spam is junk mail on the net. and uh, So you're sitting at home and you get constantly you get all this email which you never solicited from... Right. Uh, Telling you about Caribbean islands, uh, nude live girls nude. That's right. the one Just I know is not for Just in for no yeah. apparent reason. Well, they don't... It's, it's not quite that bad, but... Okay, come trickling in yeah. for some reason or other. <laughs> Whatever. And so one of these spammers, Sanford Wallace, I, I may have my facts somewhat wrong, but his ISP got dropped him, I think, and then he sued them, and these things take a while to work out, but you're well, going so to find... people are trying to discipline oh, yeah. the bad boys. Yeah. Let me give you a different case. But you see, what I want is for the internet to do it, for the ISPs to do it, and not for the government to make right. some kind of blanket laws, but there's going to be, instead of government hierarchically, there's going to be a lot of government horizontally. A kind of a, an agreement to be pol a gentleman's agreement. Well, you know, maybe not polite, but not abusive anyway. I mean, you have the same thing in the in the banking world. There are some banks that other banks won't do business with, and banks. There are some customers banks will not want as customers, and you have a big issue here now with Citibank and, and Mexico and all these other things. Uh, you know, the bank wants your business at the same time it really doesn't want the feds to come visit every day. Well, let me give you another situation. These are, this is the filter question. Let's suppose there's someone, let's make it the government, since you're suspicious of governments anyway, that don't want you to know something. In France, the government in France decides it doesn't want its voters to read polls during the so what happens? People go to Switzerland right next door and put the polls on the Swiss thing, and now everybody in France... And it's still in French, which is important. Still in French. The people in the government in Canada on election day wants to block out election coverage as the election rolls from the Maritimes all the way across to Vancouver. So they said, we're not going to allow people to hear. Of course, people in, in the East Coast can hear the election results for their provinces at 7.30 at night, but it's blacked out in the West. But the internet just reports everything that was they heard about Maritime. It goes right on the internet. So if you're in Vancouver and you want to know what's going on... Now, if you were king or queen of one of these countries, or the president or the prime minister, isn't this... What can you do? I mean, you have a federal policy. You have good social reasons for doing this. And then this thing comes along and you can't do it. Um, on that one, I think you give up. I, I don't... <laughs> I'm I'm a fan of freedom of information. No, oh, that was it's hard to make you a king or a queen. All right, how about this? You're in Germany, and you have a social policy. You don't want Nazi propaganda, propaganda. to right. be available. Now, somebody okay. in Nebraska, in a country which has a First Amendment, is happily writing Nazi propaganda, yeah. so that the guys in Cologne or Bavaria can just read the Download Nazi it. propaganda, get all the new books, and read all this hateful material. Now what do you do? Well, if you're the Bavarian prosecutor, the you Bavi sue CompuServe, which is what they did. And, and? And it's, the case is still going on, although the, the last I heard is they're probably going to drop it. What you, can, what you can really do if you're German, I mean, this is not what I would advise. I, th I think the way to answer Nazi propaganda is with the truth. Uh, That's because you're American, but yes. suppose you're a Bavarian. But, but if you're German, 
well number one you can see this guy and ask him to block those particular sites which is possible to do although really clever people can get around it they'll go to some other ISP they'll mirror the sites and so forth the second thing you can do if you want is you can require every German citizen to use a filtering tool that will block this offensive stuff would that work in principle it would more or less work uh, again you could get around it but sort of for normal people it would probably keep the, keep this stuff away uh, so the nation state does have the ability to beat the technology if, if it wants to if it's willing to shoot people to do it does it have to be that forceful pretty close and suppose, that's wait, suppose I were the cultural minister of France and I just felt because I'm French that I want I want French people to watch 62% right. of French content stuff on the net. You can make them all buy a browser that will count their pages, check for French or foreign words, and block out the screen once they've hit their quota. Now that Should might be an obnoxious that? position. This yes. is true. You could do yeah, this. You could do that, technically. Oh, so there's, there's life in the old nation states yet. Yeah, and then everybody in France would pretend to be an American foreigner and, and ask for special dispensation. Um, that's I mean, okay. let, me, let me answer the question slightly seriously. You can do a lot of things with technical means. You can also get around them with technical means. If you're willing to be a draconian government, you can do a lot. You can get your citizens to spy on each other and you can, you can squash dissent, you can squash the truth, but you're going to create huge problems, I mean aside from being what I would consider immoral and stupid, but you can do it and you see that happening in North Korea where they don't even have the internet and so forth and so on. But if you want your citizens to benefit from this Censorship doesn't work. Suppose you, suppose I'm I'm I've got a, a a Molotov cocktail recipe hydrogen bomb put it together in your basement yeah. sort of thing. So I have the you know terrorist.com and you could look up and you could figure out how to make a bomb. I think most societies would find that a little bit even though it is information. Yeah. They would find it scary to have available to just anybody. How do you feel? Well, I find it scary too. Uh, on the other hand, that stuff is already available in chemistry books. and Maybe not quite as easily. N not quite as easily. Is that a difference that you worry about? It's a difference I worry about. What would you do about it? At this point, ignore it. Because I think the people who are really going to make bombs can get it anyway. And I don't, it, I'm scared of it, but I think it's a better approach than trying to make it secret, because then you're going to have teenagers emailing encrypted messages with bomb making instructions and it will get much worse. I mean, by forbidding it, you give it a certain allure. Now, he, let me ask myself another question. Okay, so forget that. Uh, now I've got the secret floor plan of some nuclear facility and can I put it on the net? No, because that's a trade secret and you can be sued not not in terms of censorship but in terms of it also breaking a, a secrets act. Yeah. yeah. And so I mean there is there is information that should not be published. I'm I'm willing to agree with that. I don't think bomb making instructions which is sort of generic information if you try and squash that it won't work but these things are troubling i mean i'm not saying this stuff is easy but i'll ask you curious just by the by you are now spending more time in washington i notice yeah um you work for president clinton on that committee or whatever that is yeah um, it was actually more for al gore than clinton for al gore um now mitch capor one of the fellows you mentioned who you seem to like he found it like really boring Yes. And he couldn't seem to even sit through the meetings. In fact, he left because he just couldn't stand it. Do you find um, Washington pleasant, uh, more than pleasant, or Mitch Kapor like <laughs> Well, I like, I like things as long as I'm learning. And I haven't figured Washington out yet, so I like it. Um, you're also on Ross Perot's board, are you not? 
I'm on his advisory board oh. of, of his company, not of his campaign. <laughs> oh, the advisory board of his company? Yeah. Not the that board. means I'm not responsible for anything they do. Oh. What's he like? Um, well, when I first met him, which was, oh, when I was on Wall Street, 1980 or something, he was, he was terrific. Uh, he was funny and smart and uh, no, no, I don't know, if, is this a family audience or? Yeah. Oh, you mean, why are you about to say something uh, that, is there anybody here under 18? <laughs> no, you can say a bad word. No bullshit. Um, see, I may be on the internet, but I'm really polite. <laughs> <laughs> and one, one day, this was, when I was still on Wall Street, I was following Electronic Data Systems, which was his first company. And they had just hired a new head of human resources because people were beginning to care about that kind of stuff. And Ross Perot said, well, folks, I want you to meet our new head of human resources. This is Jack Frost. He's just joined us from the Army. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, now I don't want you to think we're all going to sit around here holding hands and humming or anything. <laughs> <laughs> he's a man's man. That's yes. right. Uh, you know, lately I think he's gone a little excessive in some of his opinions. but. Choice word. Yeah, I like I like people with with convictions. Well, let me ask you about your convictions on this one. What do I do in this situation? I am I I start a a, a homepage on the internet called uh, Robert's Ponces. It's just thoughts that I have, which I feel are so riveting that I wish to sell them for say a dollar. This must be a joke. No, no, no. <laughs> More than a joke, it's not a joke, I have even gotten a sponsor, the Disney Corporation, very, very big, famous company, and Mickey Mouse will present. Well, that's probably not the best way to go about this, but... <laughs> uh, maybe not Mickey Mouse, but some, some, some Goofy. character with... Goofy. Goofy will present uh, Robert's Ponces. Now, what I notice is that Robert's Ponces goes out on the net is I discover that people are busy making copies uh, t uh, t and st basically copying my ponces and sending right. them off without paying me anything. And this makes me irritated. What the Disney company notices is that their Mickey Mouse character and Goofy character are being collaged and given sex organs and other kinds of horrible things. <laughs> so Disney's upset that their image is being tampered with and I'm upset that my ponces are being copied for, for free. So let's handle this one at a time. First of all, if I turn to this community and I say, do not copy my ponces without paying me a buck, what are my chances of collecting? Well, there are a bunch of things you can do. First of all, you can say, well, nah, you can't have my ponces. And you can give them only to 10 people with whom you have a firm contract and you know who they are and you have, you'll go after them if you start seeing the pensees go anywhere else and you know who these 10 people are, you control it very, very fiercely. And well, that you, means you I can, only make $10, but I hope to, yeah, I have well, bigger ambitions. Okay, you could try charging them $10 a piece and make $100, but you know, no, that you won't can, get me you through can, the year. You can, control, you can control the copying if you try hard enough. You cannot control the price people are willing to pay for your precious pensé. So, sorry, it's the, the facts. Now, <laughs> if the there's a cast thing, about this conversation that's taking on a slightly ugly turn, I'm sure you don't mean it in any way. <laughs> the second thing you can do, you can use little technical tools. You could watermark them so you could see who was copying them and then go after them. That means or, I have to hire a lawyer and things yeah. like that. Or you could use various other kind of encryption things. One of them is called a cryptolope, which is a great name from IBM, and there are others. And you could kind of enclose these pensées. You could encrypt them. You could code them, and then you would allow people to open them only for reading on the screen. They couldn't copy them because you'd, you'd have software that would, would prevent this. To be honest, it's probably not worth it for the amount of money you would hope to collect, she says politely. But you can do that technically. 
And you well, what can is the practical solution to my problem? Give them away for free and charge for your appearances. Give away my ponce? Yes. <laughs> See? If they I like give it. away my ponce, how do I... What do you mean, charge for my appearances? It makes you famous. And then, you know, forget the 92nd Street Y. You can go to Carnegie Hall and charge. <laughs> <laughs> I've always thought Buttonweiser was equal, if not greater, than Carnegie Hall. <laughs> uh, so you're saying then that... that People or who you have could intellectual into, property, just yeah. you know, who have written stuff right. down, should not expect to to try to control the copying of that. Well, let me let me be perfectly blunt and maybe uncomfortable and so forth, but I am not paid for doing this here. My publisher wants me to do it because they hope they will sell more books. A book is a tangible thing, so I'm giving away my valuable pensé this evening, in in the hopes of recouping later through my publisher. But is that and a model that would work if, let's suppose I'm Dostoevsky and it's Moscow and it's 1868 and nobody cares about my princes until later when well, I'm... Well, you could, you could do readings. You know, you get society ladies to sponsor you. But if I'm shy, brilliant but shy. <laughs> <laughs> then you have a problem. No, um, I don't know. This is, well, is this a just solution? No, I mean, what, we could lose. What happened was if you know Homer had been shy. Well, what you, you would probably do is you would offer to write letters for people who were illiterate, for example. I mean, you do some kind of service. The the rules change. What what made a successful business a century ago is no longer what makes a successful business now. And a hundred years from now. Some decades favor the shy, some favor the noisy, some favor those who can write well, some favor those who can dig ditches. But the time you're, you, the era you're suggesting is that people who are somewhat performance oriented and who will turn their art into a show will have an advantage over those who like to work privately. By and large. Although if you're a writer and you just really want to write, then you can write and you're going to say this is disgusting and commercial, but it's the real world. You can write advertising for Mickey Mouse. Uh, you could write screenplays for Disney. You could, you could indeed find a sponsor for your literary works. You could sponsor yourself. You could give your pensées away for free and work as a waiter if you really believed in your pensée. What about, what's the, let's go to the Disney problem. Disney does not wish to have Mickey dis, d d distorted, caged. right. Uh, in principle, they can sue, and they do, in fact, have a bunch of lawyers, as does Mattel, I've run into a few of those, who go around and check out websites and send people letters and protect their trademark, which is what they're required to do to protect the integrity by law. And frankly, I think, I think you're going to want to give away your copies as a business case, and you're going to want to protect the integrity of your trademark as a business case. I mean, it's, there will be lawyers so a in cyberspace. There. That is once I, my yeah. ponces, uh, you would argue, if my ponces were taken up, chopped up, and then turned into uh, you know, a collage of some kind, I could, in a sort of, uh, as a moral right, say, hey, don't touch my ponces. Yeah, you could say, I want to preserve their integrity, and I'll sue you. And hmm. you may decide it's not worth it, or you may decide it is worth it to protect your reputation. Uh, you know, life is not easy, and people are not always honest or fair. I have a bunch more of these, but I'm a little worried that, that people are going to want to ask questions. It's, uh, it, oh, so we've already gone about an it's hour time. and 20 minutes, yeah. It um, was fascinating. Let me, uh, uh, just, <laughs> <laughs> you did go visit Bill, Bill Gates thinks that you're something of a socialist for feeling No, sure. no, I'll, you want that one too? Yeah. Okay. Well, like everybody else, Bill Gates heard that I had said software, I said content, but he cares more about software, that it will, it will be free. And that was sort of an overstatement. I said, you need to plan your business as if it will be free, because that's where it's heading. And of course, that's being translated to Esther thinks software should be free. And also, she hangs out with this Mitch Kapor guy, and he's a known socialist, which is also not true. So that's what he thought, and we talked about it, and I persuaded him that it wasn't true. You have been invited to his world-famous house. Yes, I was. Where there was a glass blower on the... On yeah. the uh, could you just describe the house? <laughs> and then I'll stop. Then I'll stop. 
Okay. Well, among the other people who were there was Bob Crandall from American Airlines, who has always been kind of a hero of mine because the one thing I do buy is airline tickets. And, but I was sort of disappointed because he came up to me and he said, you've got to help me describe this house or understand this house. And I said, why? He said, well, I got to tell my wife about it. And to which my reaction was, so why am I better at that than you are? <laughs> um, but it was, it was pretty amazing. Well, I can't read Bob Crandall. And I, about what, what, can you tell us what it was like? It was sure. big, right? Well, the day when we got there, it was crawling with Secret Service agents because not only was Bill coming, so was Al Gore. And the Secret Service agents told us, well, you know, yesterday there was none of this grass here and there was none of the furniture because the house wasn't quite done and they brought it all in for us. And oh, it was think, temp, temp furniture. Yeah, temp. And I think now it's actually all done. It was, it was very big. The pool was great. It had a fossil, a big fossil on the wall and kind of a tiled version of the fossil in the water. Did uh, you swim in it? No, no time. But you I'll are go famous. Back. Uh, in fact, someone has said that uh, your favorite perfume is chlorine number five. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you swim a lot. But anyway, you weren't allowed in that. You didn't find it possible to. Yeah. So was, is there a big dining room? Is it sort of is it like a castle kind of like? Um, no, it's it's a big mansion set into the side of a hill. It's got stairs that look sort of like a funicular. <laughs> it's got a bunch of balconies, a little stream with spawning salmon if it's the right time of year. You're uh, kidding. No. Are they real salmon? They're not computer controlled. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe in the winter, I don't know. Uh, there's also, there's a very nice, cozy library. I mean, given, given what you could do stupid with a lot of money, it's actually very tasteful and it's, they have wall panels that are electronic, but it's not neon. It's it's more stone and wood and fabric and you know than electronics all over the place. I'm sure if you did an X-ray and you looked at the wiring, it would be incredible. But <laughs> from the outside, it looks pretty nice. Okay, well, I I could ask more, but I won't. So you guys, it's your turn. Uh, that is, what we should do is just raise your hand, and I'll call you, and then maybe stand up so we can. And you know. say who you are, because I really believe in transparency and openness. And to help transparency in this case, we're going to turn on the lights. Yeah. Who I am? Samantha Gregory. I have a I'll repeat them so, so if people can't hear in the back. Okay, this is Samantha Gregory, is what we know so far. A confession before I start. I know very little about the internet, very little about new media. I work in an advertising agency. Ah, which one? <laughs> so much for transparency. Oh, you said, okay. They'll just offer you a job. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, as a woman, if you felt like the media 
portrays women. Uh-huh. And I know, and I'm sorry, and this is like the very feminist question or whatever it is, but I want to ask. Okay. Do you, do you want to hear the question? Um, don't apologize. It's perfectly fair. Well, first, let me say just one thing about the Vanity Fair article. Uh, my basic reaction was, Jesus will help sell books, and it was nice pictures. Um, my parents didn't like it because it made them sound as if they were kind of remote, and we're actually a very close family. I feel, actually, my father wrote me an email saying he was sorry, and he really hadn't said those things, and so forth, and... I said, you probably did say them, but they were taken somewhat out of context. And we're just like the royal family, you know. We, the common people don't understand us. <laughs> but it, it was an interesting article. It's, yeah, you get treated differently as a woman. I felt it didn't really talk about my ideas. It talked about me as a person. And the fact that I have a messy room is interesting, but it's not really worth a whole article. <laughs> I, you were so, profiled in Vanity Fair recently? Yeah, and they basically talked about my messy room and that my parents didn't understand me. And well, that's Vanity Fair, though. That's the kind of thing yeah. they like to talk about, I guess. But it was a very nice article and will sell a lot of books. <laughs> so. Yes. Okay, well, some, some of the fundamental ones are this whole issue of intellectual property and what's going to happen to the value of content as you have a surplus of content and the same amount of demand, which is basically people's time to look at it. Uh, I talk a fair amount about anonymity, which when I came to this, I thought was a good thing. It represents freedom and lightness and all this and a lot of the if you call them the internet community think anonymity is a good thing I don't I think it can be useful I think it's necessary in a world that's not perfect because people need to be able to say things without being put in jail if you're in a repressive government you may be somebody with social problems, whatever, and you just want to discuss them anonymously. You may be a teenager trying out new identities, or you may be a creep, but it's, there's a place for anonymity, but I think as a general rule, anonymity is not a good thing. It's like abortion. It's appropriate in some circumstances, but it should be discouraged. And I'm waiting to get a lot of hate mail about that one. Uh, seriously, privacy. I think the best solution to privacy for personal data in many cases is giving power to the customer, not to some regulatory body, because not everybody has the same preferences about what happens to their personal data. So give them the opportunity to choose. And I think in the long run, you're going to have data banks. Right now we have data banks, TRW, Equifax, and they manage personal data on behalf of mailing houses, and they sell it to them, and they collect the revenues. What I would like to see is a data bank that works for the customers, that holds my data for me, and follows my instructions, sells it for use as I request, and gives me, they take out a commission, and then they give me the revenue from selling my data. And that's the kind of thing I'm trying to foster. Uh, Systems for accountability. A lot of the way the net is going to be governed, as I said, is not going to be hierarchical top-down because the net is fundamentally horizontal and you can't carve out France because the net kind of crosses through France without really noticing it's there. So what you need is these cross agreements among ISPs. You need recourse. You need communities with their own rules. And those net communities People are in them voluntarily, so the rules of those net communities actually have a lot of moral authority, more than a government that may be elected by only half the population. In the net community, the people who are there want to be there. And if they misbehave, they can be kicked out with a lot less due process than would be required in a government that has life and death power over people. 
So those are, those are some of them. Um, and I'm happy to answer more specific questions. But thank you for <laughs> asking. Oh, I, in fairness, a lot of the scenarios that I was creating also come from other chapters well, of this they book. Come, yeah, they, they contain real ideas. Yeah. But I did not have a chapter on women. Uh, in the back, yeah. You sure you collected 70 or 80 cents even? Because um, um, you'd collect you enough. The question here. Yeah. Well, I don't see a civil war, um, but, and I'm not sure how to answer, but one point you raise is, is a very good one. The, the individual creator is probably in better shape than the publisher, because the role of the middleman diminishes. You still want editorial selection, you still want editorial services, but you don't really, you don't really need that big distribution mechanism. And that, you know, a lot of content is promoted simply in order to sell it, not because it's inherently good. And I think in the future, I hope some content that's good will pretty much sell itself. Nobody will have a vested interest in promoting it, but it will be so good that people will tell their friends about it. And I see this concept I had earlier of self-sponsorship is not, that crazy. There are a lot of magazines that, uh, political magazines that exist because some rich guy wants them to exist. On the net, when things are cheaper, more people who aren't as rich will be able just to sponsor content that they like. Or, you know, if half the people send you a dollar and the other half send you nothing, if you're a popular artist, you can do pretty well. It's when all the intermediaries take their cut that the prices go out of whack on the one side and the the artist struggles on the other. So it's it's going to be a very different new world. There are going to be lots of different business models. But the, the creative person who controls his own destiny is going to be in a lot better shape than some of the intermediaries. Yes. Well, there, there are still some small stores in the U.S. Um, the, yeah, you're going to have a lot of consolidation in Poland and elsewhere. But in terms of net businesses, I think you're, you're going to have a flourishing of small businesses. So I'm not sure. I mean, are you asking this question about the net or just about Central Europe without the net? He's about physical space. Yeah. Yeah. Cen yeah, Central Europe is going to get more corporate on the one hand, but I think the world as a whole is going to be less centralized. And, you know, someday you won't buy your sneakers in a store anyway. You're going to buy them over the net, and they'll get shipped to you by FedEx or DHL in Poland. 
so that people, because it's getting past 9.30, which is the usual time for departure, I'll have one more question way off there in the corner. Yeah. Thank you. The Wiley Agency has something to do with this book, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes. Well, first of all, it's certainly going to revolutionize the process. Um, most publishing houses, believe it or not, still, my book was re-typeset after I sent it in on, by email and disk. Um, I never, is anyone here from Broadway? <laughs> I'm not sure why, but it was. Yes, um, anyway, it was. And, you know, I don't think that's going to happen in the future. My book actually was very fast by most publishing standards. I finished it June 30 on time. Um, it, books, I think, are going to persist in their current form a lot longer than periodicals, magazines, stuff like that. The, the thing, I'm just learning about the book business. The thing that I think is going to have to change is this whole business of returns. Amazon.com is, and Barnes and Noble now getting online and so forth, they are, they are really changing the business because they can do inventory management so much better. They don't have all these books all over the country in ones and twos where the statistics don't help you if you're out of, the book in one store and you have too many in another, you can't really correct that very easily. So, whereas Amazon.com can make extremely good predictions of what's going to sell based on the orders they're getting, they ship from a central warehouse and so forth and so on. So that this whole business, the first people that are going to feel this are the book retailers. Um, there's going to be more competition for people's time. One thing I'm scared of about the internet is it's going to, people are going to find it more and more difficult to read anything serious that's over a screen full in length. And I think that's bad. Uh, I'm hoping that in the educational system we'll keep giving kids books as well as internet access. What, what's going to happen to the publishing business per se, I'm not sure, but it seems to be going through a kind of troubled period. For those of you who have further questions for Esther, she will, she will make herself available to sign books and stuff, right? Yeah, uh, I'm going so to try and save the book business tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so well, thank you very much. I don't know exactly where this will be, the, the signing. Is it, do we know? Does anyone? In, well, out, someone at the door out there will know where y you might want to go if you want to go do that. Thank you for coming. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.